All right. Well, welcome everybody. Bienvenidos. We're finally hitting the last meeting of the sort of season until we take our winter break. So we're going to thank everybody one for coming out and engaging with the community. And two, just a couple like well, house rules while we sort of go to this meeting. I know we're all tired. Now going to hibernation season. So we're going to try to be as you know, precise, concise, respectful of each other as we sort of listen to our guests for the day um, as they come up and present. Um, and if we have any questions, you know, just kind of raise it. I'll try to call you guys out. I want to do keep like we have lingering questions. I know that I uh, I'm going to strive really hard to sort of maintain it to like a two minute ish segment, right? For questions, just to like make sure that we can all get home and have dinner and see our families. Uh, um, all right. So, yeah, let's kick it off with our community council public agenda items. We'll start with the fire department. We've got a slew of them here. So come on down. But just as a reminder, if you're going to speak, it's kind of stand close to the tower, just because that way it projects. Okay, dope. Where do you want? Right here. Right there, right. Right. Hi, Al. How you doing? Um, my name's Aaron. I'm with Salt City Fire Department. We're at Station Six, just down the road here. So we're in something. Give us our little species for the chief and knows what he's had for the month. So uh, this month, uh, the topic is on occupation. So. With that in mind, everybody, you have kids and you're obviously with the neighborhood and you want to have kids uh, safe as far as strict training is concerned. A couple of key points we want to make. One is um, costume safety. If you guys are going to go out to parties, make sure you have a costume that's uh, flame resistant and something that fits well so you're not tripping over it. Uh, specifically, your kids, we're talking about this. We want to make sure they're safe when they go trick or treating. And it's not just the kids, even if you don't have kids. They're all going to be kids trick or treating in your neighborhood. So just be aware. Okay. Um, other things to think about if you're decorating your house, make sure to have things that are uh, flame resistant and keep things away from the heat source if you're decorating. That's one thing. Uh, can say be nice to have jack lanterns. Make sure you put out instead of either the LED lights or some type of battery powered candle so it's a little bit more fire resistant. Um, Decorating, we talked about that a little bit. Make sure um, when you put out decorations, everybody has to put out myself. It's my house, it's a little skeleton. It's drinking a bottle, right? it's pretty cool. But I want to make sure that that's not out sitting in front of a walkway. Make sure it's not blocking any type of pathways, your doors, emergency agents, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, candy checks. If you have kids, they're gonna go out and get some candy. Make sure you go through that candy. Make sure there's no unopened candies. If they are, make sure to get rid of that. If you wanna, well, there's a lot of dentist office around in the, uh, this community as well. If you have that candy, you can turn that into dentist. A lot of them are use and have a treat that's uh, not some type of sweet. Um, lastly on that uh, would be pets. Uh, a lot of the pets, if you have pets, Please keep them indoors. They do get spooked really easy. We don't want to have any incidents with pets either getting scared and jumping out on somebody or running away. So make sure to keep your pets in, indoors for that day. Um, also, this month happens to be Cybersecurity Month, and that's for the National for National Preparedness Month. Um, with that, a couple of key points we want to bring out. It's all about keeping yourself safe, uh, using strong passwords, making sure that you have uh, update your software regularly if you have any type of cybersecurity software. Um, making sure you avoid giving any data out to anybody, any any anybody suspicious. There have been reports of individuals calling. You guys probably all get the spam reports. Somebody calling saying they're with your bank. We've also had individuals calling for uh, either the fire department or police department and wanting some specific information from you. If you do get anything like that, make sure you. Let them know uh, politely that you call back on the pressing number so you can reach them directly instead of giving any information directly. I don't think the police department is not going to call you directly asking for any personal information. Um, along with that, you have Wi Fi. Make sure your Wi Fi is encrypted. Make sure you change that on a regular basis. We do have issues with that. Uh, that's really all I have as far as. Our community awareness. We we did have um, fire prevention week this month. 
It was in the beginning of this month. It was held at an open house at Station 7. That went well. Um, we do have open houses on a regular basis. If you guys do want to come out and visit fire department and see what we have, what, what, visit the station, do a tour. And everybody's welcome. Um, there's different dates. I cannot tell you the exact date, but it is on our website, slcfire.gov. You can look that up and uh, join us anytime you want. Um, with that said, call volume. We've had a lot of calls this month. Uh, Station 6 in particular, we ran, survey says, uh, six, six, 66 fire calls, 137 medical calls, and year to date, we've had 22,338 calls. So we also have squad six that runs out of our station, and they've done 175 uh, calls this year, excuse me, this month, and totaling 20, just over about 2,600 calls. Jet six is also at our station. They've ran about um, 60 calls last month and totaling about 650 calls this year. So we, we're pretty busy at station six. Um, that's pretty much all I have for you guys. Do you have anything else? Any questions? Oh, a couple of things we are hiring. That's why Tiki Fire Department is hiring right now. So if you're interested or know somebody that's interested, uh, please spread the word, sscfire.gov. Um, we also are hiring not just firefighters, but also uh, non sworn firefighters, just simply paramedics. We have a couple of stations currently, um, and we are going to be hiring more. So if anybody's interested that it's a paramedic, it doesn't want to be a firefighter, but does want to work in emergency services, please let them know and uh, we'll, we can get them in touch with our people. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, speaking of treats, we also have treats here today. We have waters and some sodas left over from the uh, grove. We also have some snacks. Looks like we have some other ones. Another side note. Oh, so please. Don't make me repeat myself repeatedly, but we keep some. <laughs> Indulge. Some sugar in our system is going to perk up a little bit. And up next is my favorite guy, Paul Reno. It's like Paul Reno. <laughs> and then just like when you see it, you're like, right. this. Right. Just right. that wheel then. So we'll see. Right. I don't know if I've ever showed you how to get onto our website, but it's pretty easy. But I'm just going to go over through some of these these um, numbers with you so you can actually see what they look like. Have I ever done that? I don't think I've ever done that, have I? Oh, this is okay. All right, we're, we're on for it. Okay. We get sharing real quick. Any questions while we're going through there? Concerns? Yes. <laughs> Last time was pretty, no, two times ago it was pretty brutal, so I'm, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> So just go to um, open data and then down to crime statistics. And then this will populate here in just a second. And then you can actually um, narrow it down to it, down to the bottom left corner, you see community council, and then just hit top of it. All right, so these are our numbers for this last month. Um, we don't like the color red, even though it's close to Christmas, red's not a good, a good color. Can you see it from there? Um, these are all our reported reported crimes, right? Violent offenses and property offenses. These are the reportable, the ones that we have to send off to the to the feds. So these are the ones that we are, I'll always talk about. So if you look at it, um, we haven't had any homicides, uh, knock on wood, this month. Um, there's been one rape. There's been three robberies, three uh, out, other robberies. It could be like a, a sort of a, a theft type thing. You got your aggravated assaults or DBs, your aggravated, aggravated assaults, non family. So, so um, we, we had 19 this month in Poplar Grove compared to 14.7 over a three year average. So, we did see an increase of 4.3 over this last month. And then we go down to the property offenses. Uh, normally, we're seeing 93.7 in Poplar Grove. We saw 115 this month. Um, so, we saw an increase of 21 uh, property offenses. So, a grand total of we're up 26 um, for this month. We don't like the red color. In fact, don't like it at all. Um, but so you can see that the things we're really concerned about is the vehicle burglaries. Uh, make sure your cars are locked. Make sure there's no uh, expensive stuff, anything inside your car at all. Some people uh, who have had their cars broken into a couple of times are actually leaving their cars unlocked. 
or their windows down just for that stupid reason. Um, we also got motor vehicle thefts. We got, uh, we're actually down in that, but we are seeing theft larceny, which is um, stealing stuff out of you know, porch pirates, stuff like that. So we did see an increase in that. Uh, if we go over to the year to date, we have a the year to date average. Um, and then your prior year to date. So we had one homicide last year, no homicides up to this point. This year, we've seen 14 rapes last year, 12. We're seeing those are decreasing. The ones that we're seeing the increase are uh, the non family assaults and the robbery. So if you ever want to get on and just kind of look at the month by month, <laughs> jump on this. It's pretty, pretty uh, cool, actually. If you'll go out now, I just want to show you one more thing. And then we can and go back to open data again. And then go to calls for service, police calls for service. Next two days, right? So we do keep a log of all the calls for service in the city. Pull up. So it's starting of the latest call right here at 1908. So six minutes ago, we had a call and then it just rolls down. So you can see all the calls from the last 24 hours for the, for the police department and fire department. Um, so it's like you can look by address. Yes, you can. You can kind of. Uh, put in the, now a lot of the addresses will be yeah we'll try to be because of the size <laughs> so like this one says one xx south three hundred east um, just because of some um, HIPAA or not HIPAA but other kind of rules that we've got so that's something if you want to get on and see what the, the police officers have done for the day I think we've got well over three hundred calls uh, for today well if you scroll down you'll you'll see we're at eighteen oh five so if you keep scrolling those are all the calls we got today. Um, everything 911 Yeah, this is Yeah. So, any questions? What does log mean? It, it means it's, it's currently being looked at. So, it's, it's still, it could be um, taken care of later in the day. It's just holding. So, it's not usually not a priority. And then, a good follow up. Yeah. So when it says log, and if it's like how long would a call be on the log? Is that like uh, a turnaround time? So right now our, our um, we're about nine minutes from receiving the call to responding on the call. That's about average where we're at. Now it could fluctuate depending on the on the uh, where you're at. Yeah, like if it's a priority three, which is um, a transient priority four, a transient that's sleeping on the sidewalk, compared to a crime in progress, those are going to fluctuate quite a bit. But I think we're last check, uh, we're about nine and a half minutes. So I just want to say we're at 60 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> and there's no comparison. No <laughs> <long. laughs> so if you're ever curious about why it took an officer so long, you can get on here and see the actual call that, that, uh, that came through, like you were talking about one over in, in Central over in downtown. Just find your call and give me the, the case number and I can do a little bit more in depth, look into it. So that's a good follow-up. So if red calls on the day they have heard back, they have seen sort of any case activity, would you suggest they come here? Um, if they don't remember the reference, is that how they text you? They, they do text you, yes. You get a text reference number. If you don't write that down or it's like whatever reason you didn't get it, this would be a good place to like see, but like how, how quickly would it so it's well if you scroll back up to the top should we should have some other calls already populated on it okay cool. so, so it's like instantaneous well it's not quite nice. instantaneous it's about looks like about 10 minutes out so but it's pretty close and you're not going to find a lot of information other than your call and, and the location and then right. what it's in yeah so but if you have questions you can always send me a text with that, that case. yes thank you <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Uh, up next is going to be our past representatives. Nothing. Nope. No one. It's fine. Uh, good reminder the ballot mail and ballots got sent out, so please vote. Don't forget. Drop this off. No one is reported. Do your civic duties. If you're already doing it, being here, take one step further. Just a little bit. The mayor's office. Hi, everyone. Oh, <laughs> um, I'm your community is on to the mayor's office. It's District 2 and District 3. 
Next slide, please. That's my contact information. You can call me, text me, email me. I'll try to respond within 48 hours. And if I don't, please um, send me another nudge. Hey, Alicia, what's going on? How are you doing? Next slide, please. Thank you. So every other month we do community office hours. And so I am in district two in different locations. This in November, on November 4th, I'll be at Heartland Partnership Center from six to eight. If you'd like to come by or send a friend or a neighbor to come chat with me, ask questions, give feedback to the mayor's office or this entire city, I'll be available at that time at that location. And just like, if we've got questions, are you, I mean, right, assuming it's not come down, to have coffee, but is it just like an open-ended kind of? Yes. Sir, questions about what in particular? It could be about housing, it could be about transportation, it could be about resources, it could be about almost anything. I might not have the answer at the moment, but I'm always there to um, communicate in between. I'm the in-between person between the city and the mayor's office and you. So, so it affects so, Somewhat. I inform you, or I guide you, stuff like that. So just come chat if you have a question about, if you have an idea. And if you want to know if there's funding available for that idea, I might have an answer to that or may connect you to someone out in the community that I may know. Awesome. Okay? So anything related to your engagement with the city and in your community. Okay, so the handyman program, wanted to remind you of that. I believe your councilman had that on his uh, newsletter. So I just wanted to emphasize that that program is available. It's um, funding for seniors and folks with disabilities who have um, an income that's below 80% of the medium income. There's an application process. And part of the application process is that you re it's required that you provide income documentation that includes pay stubs, social security or pension award letters. If income is obtained from retirement account from a retirement account, a copy of your last tax re return will be requested. Income of all household members will be included in your application. And part of the application is that your income will be or will need to be verified for eligibility. So it's $1,500 per household. That's the information that is available for you to connect with them if you have further questions. Okay. Next. So the ACE grant which is has been renamed from arts, culture, and events to entertainment, will, is currently opened. The application is open until November 1st. Um, you will be awarded for an event, whether it's large or small, up to $10,000, so between $500 and $10,000. Uh, last year, the mayor's office was had $200,000 to award to community events and culture and entertainment and arts. This year it's up to $300,000. So there's more funding sure. available for like Groove in the Grove or any other events that you wanna want to post this coming year. Next slide, please. So sustainability department has a fall program this year for recycling your um, lawnmowers and landscaping equipment. It's open this week for you to apply. Uh, let's see. And I did this the Spanish version, I'm sorry. But you can <laughs> you can um, scan the QR code and I can resend the um, application in, or the information in English. And next slide, please. So the Salt Lake City Arts Council is inviting you all, District 2, to apply for a, a position on the board the arts design board. Anyone interested in the arts? You don't have to be an expert. Yes. Wonderful. So the if you apply for the board and you are um, granted to be, you know, in the in the position, the the board member advises the office of the mayor, city council, and Salt Lake Arts Council. And these three entities advise on the arts and arts related activities throughout the city and the region. The board designates certain funds for eligible construction construction projects um, to commission artwork, 
the board also reviews and determines public art policy as an and is an active and is active in the arts selection process. So apply. Okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's actually it's two boards. Different, different. Mm. Arts Council. Well, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes. Um, so Arts Council Board is Renato the the three three five north. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, don't go visit. Yeah. My dog will work. Yeah. So the Arts Council Board is separate from art assignment. Uh, the art assignment board is specifically for public art. Right now we have vacancies for districts one and six. Does not mean that you should not apply. You do not need um, expertise in the arts, but if this is something that you're interested in, it's the board that recommends artists to the mayor for integration in public mm. art projects. The Arts Council board is a more general board. They oversee all of the efforts of the Arts Council. The Arts Council is also the Arts Council Foundation, it's a governmental nonprofit. So those two boards, we're still recruiting uh, for district one, districts one and six for my board, the Art Design Board. Uh, we need a license. So I'm currently recruiting for a licensed architect, and then the second position is open. So I have two vacancies, and I think uh, there are tests. Test. Any questions, I'll hang out here. But I think it's important for people to, like you pointed out, that they might be looking for a certain expertise. So like to apply for one or two more boards, because sometimes even if you apply, it doesn't mean you'll get it. Mm. Good point. Thank you. Next slide, please. I think it's the last slide. So someone's here from Love Your Block, so I'll let them speak. Is it a good time? Sure. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Diana. I'm here at the Salt Lake City Mayor's Office with the Love Your Block program, and I am here to encourage you all to apply. Um, Love Your Block is a grant up to $2,000 for neighborhood improvements. So it could be anything from beautiful art or uh, public murals. But we could do uh, community xeriscaping on park strips. We could do playground remodels or playground installation for like an empty lot. Anything that you would want to see in your community, uh, I encourage you to really dive into your com community. So I don't know if you're on a parent PTA or a corporate group, city council, really dive into those communities and see who you could tap to maybe do something together. Um, it is open to residents and organizations in the small in the west side and ballpark neighborhoods and even if you have a business in ballpark you're eligible to apply uh, we are accepting application november 1st through december 1st and that's november 30th but we changed it to have one more day to apply over the holiday weekend uh, yeah i'll stick around if you have any ideas on talking to through anything at the end of the meeting i'll be around and i'll have these flyers to pass around I have an idea. Uh, maybe plant a seed in the community. So, if the community applies for a mural, submits a mural application, like a book application for a mural, can it be placed at the Pioneer Precinct Police Station? Would that be possible? If that's where you group in the group takes place, right? Yeah. Right? That'd be pretty cool. That's all. Yeah. But that's available. Oh, that's right. oh, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. So that could be an application. Is it a private or location that as long as we have property permissions? I go. Sweet. That could be an idea. And we were to get permission from the building owner, which is probably something that you plus Yeah. Yeah. I'll pass. Could I pass you? Yeah. Sure. Be oh, question. Yeah. Is that money be used maybe in, to clean the back alleys? Oh. Uh, neighborhoods or not? Uh, yeah, I mean, say, it's right? a it's a cleanup. Mm -hmm. You can do cleanup. We have a trailer full of tools and um, gloves and bags. So really, anything you'd want to apply for, we could totally do an alley Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Poplar Grove Community Council was a grantee right two years ago. Yeah. They, they did the place making banners that you see on some of the light posts. So. Really up for interpretation from the community, by the community, for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Questions or comments now or after the meeting's over? 
Yeah. Probably after this. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. And I see that Angela showed up. You want to make an announcement? I'll just say it should be the camera. Yeah, to be a camera. That's fine. Okay. I try to show So, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Angela Romero, and I am your city. I'm your state legislator. So, if you live on um, any, if you live south of this south, Sandra Hollins is your legislature, legislator, legislator. And if you live, well, this south is kind of weird. But if you're south of this south, you're probably my constituent. I'm also the, the leader of the House Democrats. And so right now we're up for re-election. So I was just coming from another event with a bunch of other candidates and I'm here now. But um, just we just had our interim session. We're gonna have another interim session here coming in November. There were a couple of audits. You probably, if you follow the news, you saw the audit on signature gathering. And so we're looking at how to revamp that. But I just wanna make it clear that what Phil Lyman's putting out there in the papers, and Phil Lyman's been, he's my colleague in the house, he's interesting, um, it's not true. So Spencer Cox is a legitimate candidate based off of those, what we did with the audit. So I just wanted to point that out. So um, as being the minority leader, I sit on the audit committee. So I got to see whatever is being audited through the state and we have conversations and we change policy. I am also, um, the co-chair of the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girl Task Force. Now it's called Murdered and Missing Indigenous Relatives. So I'm running a legislation to extend that particular bill. And um, I'll be heading to Arizona tomorrow after work. I'm getting on a plane and I'm meeting with uh, Secretary Holland on Friday, the, the President, President Biden and tribal leaders to talk about just um, the work we still need to do at a federal level and at a, a, at a state level when it comes to our indigenous populations. I think a lot of people think when they think of Native Americans, I'm Native American, so I'm Shoshone, I'm half Shoshone. A lot of people are like, why do you care so much? Well, um, it's my family. And so a lot of times when people think about um, our indigenous populations, they just think of people who live on reservations, but most of us live with all of you in an urban setting. And um, a lot of times people go missing and we don't feel like um, they get the, due diligence that they need for families, especially if you're looking at someone who's on the reservation and a family loved one is out here. So I've been working with the Ute tribe and not Salt Lake City, but some other municipalities to just try to get some answers regarding some of their, their loved ones. So that's kind of what I do outside of just basic legislative stuff. But if you have any legislative questions, feel free to um, call me or email me. They have all my information. But I, I haven't been home today and I, I want to see my family. So I hope you all don't mind if I just leave a little early. But oh. if you have a question and you have a, a burning question, um, you, I can walk out right there and, and answer it for you. If not, I will see you after November 5th if I survive. Because I'm knocking on doors and I owe you a check still. Do you all have a demo or do I just send you a check? Uh, just a check, I think. Okay. Check. Check. My address. Yes, I know. But or you can send a tour um, to the corporate program. Yeah. I will, when I get home, because I, I will, I'll write a bigger check for you because I like you. So I will thank you everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. And um, this upcoming coming session will be interesting. We'll see what happens after November 5th and then Representative Hollins and I will come talk to all of you. But if you have any burning questions that are state related, I'm walking right out there, find me. If, if you, no one follows me, I'm just gonna go home. <laughs> Thanks everyone, see you later. Thank you. I have to pat. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And then, uh, so just as a reminder, we have a talk community question section in the end of tonight. Or I'll, this is just going to be like a listening portion. Yes. So, I okay. Uh, I will. Uh, so, we didn't have council in the last uh, week, uh, but we've been uh, non stop meetings like always. Uh, Right now, preparing for the legislative session, trying to be ready for a few things that are coming down the pipe and making sure that our city doesn't get screwed, to be completely sincere. Uh, um, every time that the legislative session opens up, uh, we are, you know, in our toe, you know, trying to figure out what's going on there and how do we stop some of the things that they're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we know. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, and this is why we have a good relationship with our legislators, but, you know, we are in the minority uh, and Salt Lake City is always in the minority, it feels like. So, uh, uh, but we are working on a few things that we are a little concerned about already with the legislature uh, and uh, certainly about uh, the, the districts and the removing Salt Lake City's power uh, and creating a pseudo uh, government entities uh, that are not responsible to anybody uh, but the legislature uh, to take your tax dollars and decide how to use it. Uh, you probably heard about, you know, the, 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 the district that the state created on North Temple, uh, which basically removes your voice from the table, it removes our voice from the table, and they are going to, they're having meetings uh, at the Capitol uh, every month to decide what to do with your tax increment. And uh, I, uh, I encourage all of you uh, to attend those meetings or find out about when those meetings are, uh, because it is uh, unfortunately how these boards and, uh, are created that remove our voice. Uh, certainly, I, you know, I was very bold uh, about talking about this. I got in quite a bit of trouble for saying things about this project, uh, but but in any case, it is important that you have a voice about how you know your tax dollars are used, especially when there is. A meeting that happens at the Capitol, uh, you know, uh, unknown hours at some point, uh, and without really public input, uh, and uh, it is it's very complicated. So that's why we always at the table uh, talking to our legislators, uh, talking to legislators that don't represent Salt Lake City as well, uh, to ensure that they know where we stand. Um, and uh, in general, you know, looking up to that, uh, obviously fixing some things in in, in the city. Uh, you probably heard those trains. Um, who has heard the trains? Who has not heard the trains? I guess it will be the question. And it's a, it's a big issue right now, uh, trying to figure out how to speed up the improvements that needed to happen. Also, on the side, trying to find out who dropped the ball, uh, to be completely sincere. How is it that uh, we found out a week before they start, they, they lifted the, no, you know, the, the, the quiet zones? Uh, it seems scary, it's fishy to me that that happened, uh, but we're trying to figure out who they didn't respond to an email. Uh, and, uh, but, but in any case, at, at, on the side, we're trying to figure out uh, what improvements need to happen. We find out what improvements need to happen. And from the council side, we said to the administration, whatever money you need, let's get it done. Let's hire fast. Uh, we also encourage our administration to talk to uh, the other city. Uh, North Salt Lake has actually quite a bit of improvements they need to do. Um, some of them very expensive, and they don't have necessarily the capacity to do it very fast. And I encourage our administration to say, let's lend a hand, uh, let's get them, you know, compliant with the quiet zones. Uh, ultimately, it's about safety, right? You know, they want to make sure that people are not run over by the trains. Um, and uh, and that is the where we are. We're trying to get that fence installed that we need to install uh, as a gate, uh, and then fix the driveway that is too close to the tracks that uh, also needs to be fixed. Um, so that those are some of the improvements that Salt Lake City needs to do. But any of the cities uh, that are out of compliance within the, the quiet zone, even one city being out of compliance means that all of us lose the quiet zone designation. So I was on the call on the call with Senator Rodney's office. I was on the phone with, uh, which is very interested in helping and an incredible uh, help to us. I was on the phone with. Uh, our lo federal lobbyists to make sure that we have our contacts at the Federal Railroad Administration and see, like, you know, can you lift some partial? Can you get us some uh, hearing faster? Apparently, it takes three months to get a hearing. So, uh, and I'm like, Geez, we're not going to sleep uh, until, you know, then. So, trying to figure out how to shake it from some place to get it all going. So, that's really what I'm working right now uh, most of my time. But um, I will welcome some questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, Sorenson, I will just make the announcements real quick. Uh, there are all the papers that I'm sending here are going to be on this side as well. Uh, so we have uh, resources for unsheltered individuals um, with places where they can go get meals, clothing, showers. Uh, other resources, shelter information, uh, contact information, email information, addresses. Um, they also have the, uh, on the 26th of October, the Westside Air Quality Sensor Show and Tell. It's going to be taking place from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And 
And if so, it's going to be at Sorensen. So just come on in. It's open to everybody. Uh, there's going to be some bagels, you know, food. You can ask questions. You can get win an Amazon $25 gift card. Um, there's also, uh, they want to remind everybody about the Nevada uh, Politico. In October, we'll it's going to be in Spanish uh, for all the uh, Spanish speaking residents of the community that want to sort of engage and hear sort of, you know, different sides of the local aisle. Uh, and then the Youth City uh, Teen Program uh, for after school programs. Just a reminder for May just 12 to 18, uh, it's going to be Monday through Friday from 2 to 6 p.m. Uh, and they'll have several activities that I don't know off the top of my head. So, if you want more resources, please swing by the Swords Community Center or go to the website. Uh, reach out. Oh, yeah. uh, do we have anyone from other side village to have any updates? Nope. Okay. And anyone from NeighborWorks? And every house didn't have anything. So uh, we just have some updates. So thank you. If you came to Group in the Grove, we appreciate you attending. Or if you had a table there, we appreciate you being there. Uh, put on your calendars for next year, still the last Saturday in September. It, it is going to be on September 27th from 11 to same time, same place. Uh, so we hope to see you again next year. Um, also, again, just a reminder. We don't meet during November and December just because we kind of start flashing with some big holidays there. So we'll see you again on January 22nd. Um, and again, just to remind you, uh, if you want to know about all the developments and things that are happening in our neighborhood, we have the organization input uh, page on our website, just under where we have our news. Um, you can read about the projects, you can see like the planner in charge of it and things like that. Um, feel free to of uh, getting feedback that way. Um, open mic nights at Sugar Space are still going on uh, on the first and third Sunday at 5 to 8 p.m. there at Sugar Space on 132 South 800 West. Uh, and if you don't know why the trains are going, it's just um, the Federal Railroad Administration has temporarily suspended the uh, quiet zones after identifying four train crossings with not meet safety requirements. And so now they have to hold the horns because they're, they didn't meet the safety requirements and they can't reinstate those uh, quiet zones until all of the crossings comply. So hopefully they can get that soon because I'm <laughs> sick of hearing trains at 11.30 at night, you know? Yes. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. So, and uh, if you have once more information, there it's tinyurl.com slash slcqz. So, there we upgrade to info well, on that page. And a quick question just is there anyone that like residents can reach out to to sort of like expedite this process in terms of like getting? Oh, completely. But I, so, trains. I'm sure many of you have heard about how much I love trains. And I, uh, so the, there is still a thing that is useful to do, which is reporting. The, the issue with trains is very complex. As you know, the Union Pacific and organizations like this have pseudo power to do whatever they want to. It's very old. Is like they are private entities. They have more power than government. I mean, it's just insane. But when I met with them in Omaha, I traveled myself to Omaha to talk to them twice. Um, the first time they did an open door, very beautiful building. The second time they did, uh, learn that they use the reporting system, the complaint, they have a website for this, uh, to measure if we need improvements. And they show their website and say, look, Salt Lake City, there is two calls every year, five calls every year. So therefore, there's no problems, no one complains, no issues. Right. And I was like, Along my mind, I was like, no, this is obviously not the problem, right? There is a lot more issues. So reporting uh, any issues related to train, the more that we go to the, the reporting website, uh, the, the better we're going to get. So the issue of trains uh, related to this could also be reported there, but it's a block crossing. So anytime that the train is stopped or blocked, 
uh, you can report it. But uh, I will say, just keep me informed of what issues you're seeing with trains, because I need to gather the more data, the better I am. Okay, so yeah. your recommendation is email you if we have any complaints, or do you have like the website that we Yes, use? I can send yeah. it. You can to send it to us. us. You can send it to us. So really and just info at poplar grove slc.org. Okay. So, thank, thank you. you. And trust me, guys, like the more we report stuff, the more we need to improve. As to all of our tell you, I have called enough about problems in the neighborhood. At least we've really done the nerve. That's why you haven't heard me complain in the last two months. I've been missing. I know. I miss you too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, um, they are doing so. Some students from the University of Utah are doing a study on the effects of that 20 miles per hour speed limit change on the residential roads that they did a few years ago. I don't know if it's sponsored by the university, but they are University of Utah students. Um, we'll have a in our meeting recap, we'll have the actual link to the survey. It's I did it, it's very short, just kind of like what changes have you seen? Uh, there's also the QR code right there if you want to uh, take it. Um, but just this. See, just kind of see if this was a good change or if it was kind of pointless. They just kind of want to know. So, all right. So, uh, and also something going on with Sorensen is the Utah uh, Refugee Civic Engagement Forum. Uh, it'll be you know, empowering immigrant and refugee voices. That'll be Saturday from one thirty to six, and there will be free food. So. Go and get your lunch. <laughs> um, and again, well, for the most part, day guys be here. Yeah, election day. On... I want to see everybody vote. That's, that's, <laughs> but I want you guys to go. <laughs> <laughs> go to polls, mail your ballot. Um, if you need information on how to vote, vote.utah.gov is your best friend. So yeah, early, the plans, the lines, just go on there. Yep, it's very important. Okay. And such thanks, neighborhood house, for hosting us as always. My favorite location is neighborhood. Okay. All right. Now and we're, we're just going to go straight to the Bible. So, uh, okay. Foreign to South Viaduct Trail updates on that. Sorry, I just lost. That's usually it. Me get your slideshow. I think I can pull it up here. Let's see. Sorry, I was so prepared and then I was taking that speed limit study and then I just. <laughs> Are you, are you showing the screen? I can, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. Oh, but either way. Yeah, I think right. it's good here. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Hi everyone, my name is Mary Sizemore. Um, I work in transportation with the city. Um, I have a to go back. I have a little question about the roll chair. If you could get a little closer. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, I'm just trying to store the block. Oh, that's yeah, right. Just if you can kind of project towards the. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, my name is Mary Sizemore. I'm with, the, with Salt Lake City Transportation. Uh, we have Renato uh, from the Arts Council. Is back up here, and then we have Laura, um, and she is our uh, one of our artists who's working on the project here. So uh, we just have a little presentation here. I'm gonna have some of the slides a little quickly because uh, they get a little into the details. But uh, just wanted to come here and share some updates on the 400 South Viaduct Trail here back in uh, in in February. Uh, it looks like my slides aren't. Advancing. Don't need to see if I can share it. That might work best. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I see. Thanks. Want to start the second slide? That's perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. No, all of it. Let me. We're doing a lot. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so here it is. <laughs> Let's see. Let's do it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so just to give uh, a background on the project and what it is. Um, so this is on 400 South from 9th West, just over there, um, to 2nd West downtown. Um, we are looking to put in a multi-use trail as well as a two-way bikeway. So the multi-use trail will go from 9th West to 5th West, getting you over the viaduct. Um, without getting stopped by trains, very exciting. Uh, and then going east from 5th West to 2nd West is going to be an on-street protected two-way bikeway. So um, so we're kind of in the later design phase of this project. We're looking to go to construction next year. Um, and we're really excited about this project, not only because we're you know trying to enhance options for people um, in the ways that they travel, but we are incorporating art directly into the design of the trail. So uh, so this is just kind of an overview of some other projects that it'll be connecting to. The green lines are different biking facilities in the city. Uh, so there's existing protected bikeways on 2nd West, um, another two-way bikeway protection that's coming on 3rd West next year, uh, and then some other bikeways, future green loops. So and we're really excited to get this protected facility across the east-west divide, connecting Poplar Road to the larger protected bikeway network in the city. And then we go to the next slide. Um, and then these slides that are coming up here are kind of just details about the, the trail design. And I, it's probably hard to see. So um, feel free to catch me after and I can walk through um, any locations that are interesting to you. Uh, but I just want to point out here at 9th West, you're going to be seeing some more green paint out there because on 9th West, three of those legs of the intersection, they have bike lanes. Um, and then this fourth leg, is now going to have that multi-use trail. So you can walk and bike there. It's going to be a pretty wide trail. Um, and, and so we're excited to kind of get all four lakes of that intersection to be bikeable. Um, and then it'll just kind of continue here. And then on the next slide, you'll see that it goes across the viaduct um, kind of on street because if we had to put like more concrete on a bridge, you basically have to re like rebuild the whole bridge. So we have an on-street two-way bike or two-way like multi-use trail. It's really wide. Uh, it's protected by Jersey barriers, vehicular traffic. It'll be maintained um, by our parks department for plowing and things like that. Um, and then that'll just get you across um, on the next slide. Perfect. Thank you. Across to the other side to Fifth West, and from there, this is where it'll start to become a two-way bikeway, and then the existing sidewalk. A spot where people can walk uh, or or wheel in their wheelchair. So, um, so the next slide, they just kind of go more of the design details. That two way bikeway continues um, along Pioneer Park. Um, we're retaining as much on street parking as we can, um, and then it just continues all the way to Second West on the next slide. So that's kind of the boring nitty gritty of the project. But I want to hand it off to Renato and Laura to talk about the really cool art that's coming. Yay, hey, fun. Uh, hi, um, my name is Renato. I do the public art program over here at the Salt City Arts Council. Um, I'm here to introduce Laura Hata, who is one half Hata Rugen, who are the commission artists uh, for this project. This was super interesting to us. Instead of us commissioning an artwork based on you know proposals, like our typical public art process, how it goes, we decided to integrate an artist into the engineering and design process and talk with you. We were here earlier this year to sort of get some feedback and then in order for them to go back and create, um, integrate art to, to the, the project. So we don't only want to make uh, city infrastructure better, prettier, uh, more exciting, but also create a welcome.
So without further ado, Laura. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura. Um, I'm from Seattle. My partner, Tom, um, and I were out here in February and met with some of you and talked through some of the, um, the goals of the project and kind of gathered stories and um, learned a little bit more about the neighborhood. So our main goal with this project is really to kind of pull our, the, the safety in turn apart, um, but really um, conceptually to stitch together the west side with the east side. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, we, we kind of focused pretty quickly on the fence along the south side of the viaduct as the primary art opportunity because it is visible from cars driving by, of course, from people biking and walking along the multi-use trail, and then from locations to the south, um, um, other bridges, you'll be able to see this fence. So that's the place where the art will be located. Um, um, we, so we, the last time we were here, we had a whole bunch of boards with precedent art examples and thinking about how art could be created. So um, as we gravitated to the fence, we started to look at some of the examples that got a lot of, um, of positive dots on them. Um, and um, what we kind of gathered from, from these images is that um, color was very important, um, light would be nice, um, and, um, and just kind of like, I think, big gestures were the things that people were really interested in. And then um, the image over here on the left is a concrete barrier that is used to um, separate the um, car traffic from the multi-use trail. So safety was another large concern that we heard. So we were able to incorporate that concrete barrier at the time we came. There wasn't a concrete barrier. It was just kind of bollard. So um, it will be a lot safer as a result. Um, next slide. So we... Uh, I wanted to start with our material palette and then explain um, kind of how we got here. But we, we started to think about the materials of the road and um, things that would be um, reflective, that would make it maybe a little bit safer um, and, and that idea of reflecting light. Um, so we, um, we have a palette of um, sign films. So this is the type of film you would see on like a caution sign. Uh, but here we've got kind of a rainbow palette and we're also using the same colors in um, polycarbonate panels that are incorporated into the fence. Um, next slide. So, um, so when we were here, we um, we heard about and we saw the wild peacocks that live in Poplar Grove, and we were really taken by this. And um, and I think it was with you. I'm sorry. Good night. <laughs> no, you said that I thought profound and poetic, and I'm not going to say it in your exact words, but what you said was that the peacocks um, are, you know, they're an introduced species, they, they are not native to here, but they've um, kind of adapted and acclimatized, and you like that to the people of the community who um, are from all different places, and so I thought that was a really great metaphor. So we started to, you know, the peacock, of course, is beautiful um, also, but that symbol was really powerful. So we started to look at like the structured color of the peacock and, and saw some correlations with this sort of reflective film. So that became our palette. Um, next slide. Um, and we were also looking at landscape typologies, just understanding that, you know, the landscape is very important to the people who live here. Um, so the qualities of the colors of the, the Jordan um, River Trail has the blues and the greens and the whites and then the Wasatch Mountains in the fall have these beautiful golds and browns. Um, so sort of starting to piece together some palettes within this larger palette that represent the landscape. Um, next slide. Um, and so we have these kind of typologies of white and blue for snow and water, the sun colors, the Salt Lake colors, the Jordan River, the mountains, and then the what we're calling the full peacock. Um, so next. <laughs> Um, so we have a very long fence. It's like over 1,800 feet long or something. It's 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 real. It's like a quarter mile long. So this will definitely be the longest artwork we probably will ever design. So um, so we had we had to do something that was economical and that could be buildable by the general contractor rather than 
you know, artists making things in their studio. So we have, um, have a design that's made up of um, posts with horizontal railings that are in all these different locations. And together, they create kind of a waveform. That was another thing we really, a lot of people really gravitated to the images that were kind of sinuous and wavy. Um, but this was a kind of a buildable version of that. So the color palette starts on the east side with, and it's very hard to see here, I know, but kind of the, the browns and the greens and the golds of the, the mountains and then moving into the sun colors and then the kind of snowy peak colors. And then where the fence gets highest over the railroad, um, we go through this kind of color spectrum, which we liked because it was a way to kind of like, as you're moving along the trip, you kind of, move through the colors and it gives you kind of a sense of your emotion and your position um, within the trail. And then when you get over to the west side, we kind of move into the colors that we're identifying with the, um, with the Great Salt Lake. And then at the very end, we have this big crescendo, which is the full peacock moment where all the colors blend. Um, and then we're also incorporating these acrylic panels periodically that will, um, add color punches. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this is the view of the fence from um, from you know below. So it the the idea is that um, or our hope is that people will either um, pass underneath it or drive past it and see this very colorful motiony thing and be attracted to want to um, travel across it by bike or walking. Um, next and then here's a view um, as you're kind of driving. So in addition to the fence, we have some, um, some uh, lines that are kind of carrying the wave through. So the, the fence is primarily steel. The, the dark gray elements are painted or powder coated steel with a mesh behind that is uh, kind of a, a, a safety element um, required by the railroad and by UDOT. And then the colored rails are the reflective film. So they will be attached to the metal steel rails. So they can be removed and replaced in the future as needed. Um, next. And here's just an image of that kind of crescendo, the, the peacock moment. And then on the new barrier that separates the trail from the car traffic, we're mirroring the lines that are used um, under the fence so it kind of feels a little bit like you're in this um in this uh motion um and then um i think you can go to the next slide i think the last one oh and then okay at night um we are anticipating that car headlights or bike headlights or even if you're you're walking and you have a headlight which i think would be pretty fun um you'll see this um, kind of reflective um, film and it will glow and be a safety element, but also an aesthetic um, experience. Uh, next. And then this is, uh, this is the kind of the, this is a preliminary design. We've updated it a little, but this is starting on the east side and moving to the west side. So these are again, those kind of mountainy, fall mountainy colors. And so the minimum height here is that low fence. And that's the requirement for a fence, a railing over the street. But then when we get into the portion that's over the railroad, the fence has to be this minimum height of 10 feet off of the um, paving. So we kind of like bumped up in places to create that waveform um, and then are using where we place the color to um, create sort of the downslope of the wave. Um, so it is, like I said, it's very long and this isn't even long enough. We did this and we're like, no, wait, it's not long enough. <laughs> so we had to add more. So, um, so now we're kind of coming to the portion at the, um, the coming to the West, the West end. And this is the portion that wasn't long enough here. So it will get quite a bit longer. Um, and then, um, ending with these, this peak up moment. And, um, I think that's the last slide there. We're excited that um, we're, you know, able to do something that's functional, but we think we'll also add a lot of like visual interest for people. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and open it. So how high is the walkway? On the train is the two inches. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> cool. And then up next, we're going to have the solid smooth surfaces. We have an update. I don't see online. Works. Okay. So we're going to have, if anybody else actually does have some announcements, so I'm just going to make them real quick. Good announcements, and we're going to move to the public comments and open discussions. Oh, wait. Yes. Come on. Let me get your PowerPoint going. So, everybody, I was here about a year and a half ago to talk about the new album about which process. We'll see if we can see it. So um, it'll be open in a week for driving. I'll give you an update. Um, One second, it was kind of okay. looking normal. <laughs> They're too big. Somehow, yeah. <laughs> you can show them really small. Let me get it more like this. Yeah, we'll show that. So this project was a citizens uh, sponsored CIP project. And could you maybe move over more here? So yeah. we got a really good bid because we wanted to do other projects, only four hundred and fifty thousand for this project. Um, and whenever I go to Bend, Oregon. My friend Scott has built 40 roundabouts, art, and they have an art tour for the roundabouts. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Bend, Oregon. I'm not the Silicon Valley, but um, let's go. Let's go to this slide. Yeah. The second. Second slide. Okay. So the roundabout you see out there it does have a small portion in the center for art, and they're going to build a concrete platform. And this is a side view of that flat. These are the walls. And some, there's going to be landscaping, a few small shrubs, low, low, uh, low height shrubs. So there will be opportunity for art. Author, author, growth. It won't be, shouldn't be from anywhere else. But I do have some ideas from, from Ben. So the next slide shows some of the things they did. This is my favorite one, this little sculpture. So they, they have 40 roundabouts with art. So, you know, this, it could be anything as long as it fits in that little quote. Um, yeah, next slide shows some more. I like this one too. And they, they have names for each of these sculptures and I think they were um, contests, you know, artists come and they, they apply and they do a contest to be in the roundabout. So it's a pretty good program in Bend, Oregon. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but we have three roundabouts being built this summer. And one of them is in front of the state capitol. Have anybody heard about that? And I worked on that 24 years ago. It took 24 years to get that one approved, designed, and funded. And it, it's a $1.7 million project. But unfortunately, there's no room for art in that roundabout. So your roundabout is better than that almost $2 million roundabout up, the, up at the state capitol. So um, go to this one. That's what it looked like today. This shows that center. Are you just going to have a minimal Maybe. Next slide. Yep. 
Oh, that's a great question. Um, how do you next question is how do you how do you drive through? Yes. How do you drive through a roundabout? So the roundabout will be yield sign controls. So the yield signs on each approach. And if you're a driver in a car, you need to use your blinker. If you're exiting the roundabout, use it to blink right. If you're making a left turn, you can even blink, use your blinker to go left around the roundabout. If you're a pedestrian, you've got, let's go back to this picture here. Yeah. Pedestrian has some special places to cross. And on two of the legs on the busiest street, which is 7th South, there's actually raised crosswalks. And there's refuge islands out here. And so the pedestrian will be a little bit higher than the road. And it'll have a 10 foot wide uh, raised path to cross, which is, is pretty unique. And any cars going over those, uh, those raised crosswalks will have to slow to 15 miles per hour. So that's, that's kind of a cool, a cool feature for this roundabout. I've done 300 roundabouts in my career, and only two of them had raised crosswalks. This is pretty unique. Um, let's, let's, go, let's go to another picture here, this picture. So this, this shows the crosswalks that I'm talking about. So it, it's huge, 10 foot wide, and the, the pedestrians actually have more priority than the parks, so they've got this this huge area to cross, and the cars have to slow down and look for that pedestrian. And here's a side view as, as you're going across it. But you'll be able to drive it next week. It's not open yet, fortunately. So that's an update for that project. Um, next project I'm going to talk about is, is on your border on Indiana Avenue. And it's... Uh, it's three four, four speed cushions and one traffic island. This is the Porkchop Island, Goshen Street. And that's just south of the roundabout here in 10th West. And then through here, there's one, two, three, four uh, speed cushions. And the speed cushion is different from a speed bump because it has screws in the middle for a fire truck to go through without having to slow down. Or a police, police car? No, a police car won't, won't work. But a fire truck has a wider um, wheelbase, so it can go through faster. And we have a fire station right here, but we want to. We don't want to slow down them on any of the rescues or the calls. That's key feature. Unfortunately, the roundabout will slow down the police on, on Seven South. Sorry, so just just go up. So the next slide. My last one, and it shows this pork chop on Goshen Street, in Indiana. And this is creating a new walkway for pedestrians to get through that, that really wide and odd intersection. So that's another place you can go. But we didn't think about that until I was here tonight. I thought, oh, listen, art. All the tree or no, no landscaping, but art, art can certainly fit out there. Okay, and any questions? Yes. So notice there's there's really no uh, bicycle lane. Excellent. Sure. Oh, can you go back to this one too? So this, this question is, how do bicycles go through the roundabout? Now, what? how do bicycles get on your last slide? Oh, on the last one. Okay. Uh, on oh. Indiana. Oh, sure. There's no bicycle lane along there. Yeah. The so there's going to, want to make sure there'll be a striped bike lane through here. Um, so it's very dangerous. Yeah. Trying to trying to ride up to that island on your bike because yeah, it'll, uh, be, it'll be there's back. kind of a, a blind spot with a turn there, yeah. and coming out of Smiths, and you oh, can. Yeah. Uh, it's so narrow that you could probably get hit by a, a car. Yeah, it's it's not a great it's not a great bike location. They did, they show sheriffs on the street. I just noticed that they don't have a true bike. I'm not the I'm not the bike planner. Mary can answer that. 
Yeah. Yeah. In the future, but we did set this island back far enough, so it won't interfere with that future bike. So that's that's a good good point. If we put it out here in the street, you know, that that would interfere with the future bike lane. But there, a lot of bikers, I noticed, like to and scooters, like to use sidewalks. This will create a new, safer route for for those people. Yeah, you, you have a, a bike lane or a, a symbol for a bike yeah, that's to have the, the right of way, but no cars are going to pay attention to that. <laughs> yeah. So technically, those shouldn't be on a road that's uh, higher than 35 miles per hour. So is it, does anybody know what the post speed is currently on India? Sorry. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. So I got 30, 35. 30 bikes. Anybody else? 40. So people might be driving 40 today, right? <laughs> so that's not good for a bike. But we, the city, we talked about change the speed limits, and that's now currently posted 25. So when you change that sign, that those numbers to from 30 to 25, does that mean traffic's going to go 25? No way, right? <laughs> so that, that's why we have a citywide traffic calming program. So the last thing I'm going to mention is we're, we're blanketing Poplar Grove with these flyers to get input on this, not just these projects, but uh, around Pleasant Grove Park, south of here, and even in Glendale, we're doing some. So um, we have done two, uh, I call, I'll call them tests, a speed, uh, speed bump and uh, crosswalk on Emory Street by Poplar Grove Park. So if you want to try out what these new devices look like that we've come up with, go drive on Emory Street. So that's all I have. Um, I'll leave a few of these flyers over here, but you should be getting one of these door stuff in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jen Bean, and I am the Development and Communications Director here at Neighborhood. Many of you probably are used to seeing Jake Erickson up here, and um, he is our wonderful staff person that has moved on to his next adventure. Um, but I thought I would let you know a few things that are happening at Neighborhood House. First of all, we are filling the community engagement coordinator position. So you will have a new contact and representative of Neighborhood House um, in just a few weeks. Um, so that's exciting. And then as far as events go um, for the remainder of the year, one that is one of the most exciting for the neighborhood is our trunk or treat. And that is going to be hosted out here in our front parking lot on Halloween from four to six. So if you have littles that get out early and want to go, or um, you have kiddos that want to make it an all night thing, start here. <laughs> We're having um, trunks uh, that are being decorated and then handing out candy um, to all the kiddos um, and folks that come around. Also, if you would like to participate and decorate a trunk and hand out candy at Neighborhood House, you can do that. Um, and all you have to do is email Paula. And her email address is paula at nhutah.org. Um, and then as far as um, the remainder of the year, we'll be having a few family fun nights um, for our families um, that we serve here. Those are usually on Thursday evenings. Um, and if anyone would like to get involved at Neighborhood House, feel free to just give us a call at any point, um, even if you have kiddos um, or aging adults or loved ones that you would like to enroll in any of our programs. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. Thing, but includes all of our public presentations. Now we're going to go into the comments section. Open discussion in the next 15 minutes. Let's get out all of us. Yeah. So, uh, 
Boy, thanks. Uh, we need more of those signs. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the wild peacock. They're wild only because they're, we, we don't use the word wild, we use the word habituated. <laughs> because as far as we're all concerned, in my yard, they're wild. <laughs> they're okay. Uh, but, but they're they're so pretty and cute, and, and it's just a bummer to have to try to pull one off the off the road. So I, I illegally put one on the uh, uh, on the hack line uh, crossing uh, towards south, uh, and uh, peacocks can't reach the hack line. But so you know, yeah. So this sign should help. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting more of these signs. Yeah, we need we need more. Because I, you know, we just like, we just, you know, sold them to like residents for like a little slush fund, like, don't build content, jocks, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. provide them like the peacock homes. Yeah, and one more comment. Uh, if we can get a couple more of those signs, I just need comments as to where we can put those, where we should put those. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, but not only that, we also yeah. uh, say that the idea of vacation or Oh, uh, so we got a new one today, and a new one before, but yeah, it's just it's so crazy trying to cross a residential street. So that people don't around and you're just trying to get like those green uh, top lines. You submitted us to be this year. Yeah, interesting. So the mayor, both the mayors, the administration first. Uh, there's a board, CFP board. With Ranks there, there's a so he used to run them and see if they need the criteria. Uh, then the board will send the mayor. So many of the you know, the, the exciting about the so, then it comes to the council. So next year, uh, May, uh, we discuss uh, all of the uh, all of the CIPs. We were meeting with every CIP submitted in the, the city. Fortunately, in the last three years, I was able to convince my colleagues to us from funding to this district. So we were able to allow uh, more CIP uh, money to this district. So we'll work it out, but I need maybe I'll reach out to that point where they're like, we have anything new to us. So maybe this next year, I'm going to need a lot of money to help make notes. Yes, next, next year. Uh, but, you know, we start discussing the budget. Uh, we meet for about eight to ten hours twice a week. Um, or just discussing the budget and fully meetings. There's a lot more meetings than that. But it's, we started about um, also discussing the budget in April, May, and uh, then we had about the budget in June. So we're not, we're not, you know. yeah, if, if you don't get it the first time, the chances go way up the second. <laughs> uh, although I, I show you guys. You try. Yep. How do we start this discussion about art then? For the roundabout. Yeah. And how do we? I mean, where does the art from? Who's going to make the art? How do we do that? Uh, so the way the art public art. Works is through the actually through the CIP program. So once the council adopts our budget, we get 1.5 percent. So we average is to be about 150 to 160 thousand dollars a year. It's actually a really small budget. It's not much. So what we're trying to do is we have a series of guiding criteria to help establish where to place where to place. Uh, this year, currently, thanks to the support of council, our budget was increased to two hundred thousand. Um, we were not able to address any of our arts collection for maintenance and conservation until twenty twenty one. So we've been doing a lot of catch up, and ten to twenty percent of our catch up is just fixing a lot of stuff. If you've seen some of the arts gardens, fixing quite a bit of stuff. We are going to be fixing a lot more other stuff. Uh, some ways in which this can happen is right now there is no funding for that or for. However, there are some options that we could do. Potentially, if you were to find funding and for 
uh, an artist wants to donate their time and make a donation of artwork to the city, you will have to go through the Art Center Board, which is what I spoke about earlier, and it becomes uh, it's a donation to the city uh, of artwork that they're presenting. If it goes through our CAP program, or if we get public art funding, you could also apply for CAP and make a specific CAP application for our specific roundabout. Um, that case, me, uh, it's our job to reach out to you all and then talk about your project, and you get a chance to fix it. Then by the time it's not sufficient, by mind, that's at the end of the calendar year. Um, then that it goes to the administration, to the mayor's board, and the current education council. Um, future funding, I think for this year's funding, we have placed an artwork in Sugar House. And, well, I mean, do they see us? They like, let's be honest, like they have to win. So uh, we're looking at several things. Right now, we're looking specifically at Sugar House. We just haven't, we try to spread the load. There are seven council districts. We'll try to do our best. Uh, our budget is small. Uh, for example, this project, uh, we did not have funding for what you're seeing. So what we have to do for this specific project was think creatively and use our very uh, finite resources to integrate an artist. So even involve means in transportation. Hey, we think it will be best if this project has an artist, this infrastructure that the city's already already built. Let's slash color it. Let's bring an artist to help them think creatively and out of the box. How do we use the material that we're spending? So I do that stuff. Uh, a lot of the times, because the joint application, uh, we've seen this happen recently. They come with a public art request funding. So, um, for example, Upper Grove Park, uh, we came here not long ago, but there's going to be tents to go all ports. There's going to be a public art project there. Then the new basketball courts work at the okay. That request came, I think it came from you all, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that request came with public art. So if it doesn't touch our CIP funding, the purpose of our thing, so we're able to administer a project a call for artists for it. So there is various ways, but unfortunately, we wish every project could get our uh, another important thing is that we don't do 1.5% of every specific project because otherwise you'll end up doing operating. You know, sample. So we pull our money, like in you know, what it means to us is to pull our money and really place our work where we think it's going to be best based on, you know, like our urban design. And, um, is that the same process? Could we just like reach out to like the group since we're going to like our district? Just as like an incentive, like hey, like if you want to help support the art installation, it's going to be next to you guys and they'll beautify. I don't know if they're going to be going through a similar process, but they went with the SDG. But council was really important for public arts and art, like they did the uh, agreement and negotiations with SDG. Public art funding was designated as part of the package. So, unfortunately, this is what I was a little bit married for. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to hear. This fourth district got how we, the city, was able to negotiate with SCG an agreement, right? And we were like, this is what the community, uh, we, we want back for using, accessing those tax dollars. Unfortunately, on the power district, you know, and the, 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 uh, the baseball one, uh, they are deciding themselves what the public benefit is, which is I have plenty of opinions about why it's not ideal. But because of some of the pushback, uh, I believe that they have a lot to gain trust in the communities. Uh, and, and they, they have the foundation, uh, the, the, the Larry H. Miller uh, Family Foundation is very active these days in the West Side specific, specifically, and in neighborhood house. And they are doing everything they can to gain the love of the community. So I will definitely reach out to the the Chelsea community. And I mean, don't don't mention my name here. Because <laughs> not, but, yeah, uh, but I would really encourage them to be part of this project if you choose to choose. To. They have a process and I can find out the the links and how to apply for this. Yeah, okay. 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 Okay.
Any other questions, comments? No. No. Well, then I guess we're going to adjourn tonight's meeting. Uh, we're going to miss seeing all you guys you again in January 22nd. We we can be again after the winter fall break. Um, yeah, so have a beer. We have treats. We have plenty of treats. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.